there's so many reasons why XR apps should be on the web and why people should build it there. It's future-proof. Every future headset will already support your application versus often you would have to upgrade to the next SDKs. I think the number one most coolest advantage that you get from the web is welcome to a new episode of XR MEI Spotlight, the show that gives the stage to the founders and makers push the boundaries of XR and AI. My name is Gabriele Romagnoli, I'm your host, and I'm here today with Jonathan Hale. Jonathan is the CEO of Wonderland Engine, a hyper-optimized 3D engine for 3D VR AR on the web. If you have played any of the WebXR apps suggested by the Meta Quest browser, it is most likely was built using Wonderland Engine. So today, conversation is all about WebXR. What are the best options for developers to build WebXR apps? The landscape of development tools or frameworks basically can be categorized in three pieces. You have code-only frameworks like FreeJS or Babylon.js. Then there's cloud-based editors. Then there's full development solutions that you download, install, kind of like Unity. And Wonderland Engine also falls into this category. Real example of how Wonderland Engine can make the life of developer easy. Wonderland Editor is going to do a lot on your assets there to make that possible. You don't have to to downscale your assets, uh, especially for textures. We're able to handle super high resolution textures. We actually have a multiplayer solution coming up with Wonderland Cloud. And the very interesting thing about it is that we mix all audio of all the players in the cloud. You can hear people from the right, left, top, back, front, all of that, like full spatialized audio, but it doesn't take the performance of the device. The future of WebXR apps on wearable devices. At MetaConnect, they announced support for PWAs in the store so you can now upload a 2D or even like immersive PWAs into the MetaQuest store. You don't know if someone's going to work in with Orion or with the spectacles, right? You want to support both ideally. I think the web just offers a huge amount of advantages for that. And an incredible alternative to typing long URL in VR that has changed the way I access the web from any headset. You can share links directly to the headset on MetaQuest but for any other headset you'll probably want to use it's a super cool website where on your computer or mobile phone, paste the URL, then go to your headset and the link will just be there if it's on the same network. But before we get into it, I wanted to thank our sponsor Meshi, who made this episode possible. Meshi is a real powerhouse for generating 3D assets with AI. You can start with a simple text or image prompt and get high quality stylized 3D models in just a minute. One feature I personally love is the ability to create stylized texture for any mesh, with or without UV. And since the release, Meshi's teams keep pushing amazing updates like texture in-painting, ultra-realistic sculpture, and the ability to rig and animate your character. To try it out, go to meshi.ai and start the seven days trial to access all these incredible features. And now it's time to roll the title and welcome Jonathan under the spotlight. Jonathan, it's a real pleasure to be here. Likewise, thanks for inviting me. Um, so I want to start really diving into the topic. So can you explain me why should developers build XR apps on the web? Oh, there's, there's so many reasons why XR apps should be on the web and why people should build it there. Uh, I think the number one most coolest advantage that you get from the web is that it's cross-platform. You'll have a browser on most VR devices like the MetaQuest, the HTC uh, devices, all of them, uh, the Pico devices, and most desktop devices can just use, I believe, Chrome. Um, but not only XR devices work with these headsets, uh, sorry, not, <laughs> not just XR devices work with WebXR, but it's also desktop and mobile, right? So. If you build an XR app, you can kind of like pick up or invite the uh, existing audience that's on mobile that might not have onboarded to the latest um, uh, devices yet or latest media yet. And you'll be able to also service like a broader audi audience with that. So you mentioned uh, being a uh, web XR uh, and being cross-platform, one of the main <laughs> one. What would you say are the other top two? So you can just jump into links in WebXR experiences, right? So if you have Zoom, for example, you know this. You can just drop a link to someone. They can hop in and then do a meeting. 
uh, inside the browser, right? That also works mm -hmm. with most other like meeting software out there. And like in, in this case, we're on the web as well, recording this podcast. Um, the same thing is possible for XR apps using WebXR. So you can just send someone a link either via the messenger directly on your phones or you can like use social media or just use a QR code or something like that and share the link and people can just jump right in. They don't have to download or install anything. It just gets right to the experience. You're bringing up another important point and that is how do I actually get into that WebXR app? And that is not always easy on a, on, a, on a headset, I have to say. So these QR code things, as I know on the Quest right now, works only when you are scanning for a Wi-Fi network. I think that is something mm -hmm. that I've recently added. So if you are looking at a Wi-Fi QR code, then you can immediately get connected. Pretty cool, meaning that likely that's something that could work also with other apps. Another thing that I don't know that if people are aware that from your mobile, you can actually cast a web link to the headset. And this is something yep. that I think people are not aware. So if you actually just have a web uh, a web page and you click share, you can share with the Meta Horizon app. And if your headset is currently paired with the, with the phone, then it automatically opens in a browser. And that for me changed the way I'm accessing now any kind of content and it's not valid for WebXR app. It's just a website that maybe I want to check or maybe a YouTube video that then I want to see in 3D. So uh, this is another important point that the way to access web content on the headset, it's kind of tricky because you cannot type a URL. It's a pain in the ass, let's be honest. But there yeah, are now a, more and more look, ways. There's another trick here. As, said for, as you mentioned, you can share links directly to the headset on MetaQuest. But for any other headset, you'll probably want to use hmd.link. HMD.link is a super cool website where on your computer or mobile phone, you open HMD.link, paste the URL, then go to your headset. And there you can just type in HMD.link again. It's very short, so it's actually okay to type. And the link will just be there if it's on the same network. So you'll need to be connected on the same network, but that is kind of magical. You can even paste links to other people with like the HMD.link slash and then question mark prefix, and then just add your URL at the back and it'll automatically add it for them. And so you can then hop into the network, uh, headset, sorry. You can then hop into the headset and then click on the link and then you're entering the experience on the web. Awesome. I mean, they, this is the kind of things that really seems small things, but make a big difference. I'm going to try as soon as we stop the call to see if, uh, to stop the record, <laughs> see if this is actually working. I do have, I want to backtrack a second. So you, we mentioned that uh, one of the things we're going to discuss is indeed like why building on WebXR. And we mentioned, of course, being cross-platform and other advantages. But on the other hand, what is the incentive? Because at the end, spending time and resources on building something for the web need to uh, have a return. And this return can be partially monetary, right? Uh, but it, there can also be other advantages uh, that could mm -hmm. be marketing, exposure, or maybe reaching out certain kind of audience. What are the actual benefits from a studio that is developing very carefully its resources, deploying very mm -hmm. carefully its resources to build or port an app on the web? I mean, you'd usually keep um, control over your IP, right? It means that you don't publish through third-party app stores. You can just have it on your own website. You're in control when you publish, when you update, uh, update your content. Um, that just gives you way more flexibility. It also works around the kind of like 30% app store fees that we uh, traditionally see today. And you can just like build in your own uh, monetization that you have on the web, right? It could be Google ads, could be a different type of ad that works immersively. Um, AVR offers those and Zesty Market offers something like that. Um, there's uh, ways to just do like in-app purchases through the web payments APIs, but also through Google Pay or maybe sending a link to someone via email and then having them pay through that. Um, I think there's a bunch of things there that where you can have the same monetization that you would on a normal uh, WebXR app, a uh, non-WebXR app, sorry. Uh, so the same monetization that you would have on a non-WebXR app but then like, you just have subscriptions and whatnot, but without the app store kind of payments. So 
these are various options. Are there some that you have seen developers uh, using more often, uh, like in when it comes to WebXR? Can you make some examples, yeah. for example? Yeah, definitely. Uh, advertising works extremely well just because there's there's two reasons to this. One is that people, when they're on the web, they're uh, approaching the web from a perspective where they think it's free content, and so it should mm -hmm. remain free. I think most of us still use YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all of these for free. Um, so we're being monetized on a, in a different way there. The, uh, the other reason is that it's actually because people are in VR while they're using the WebXR experience, it is super interesting to v VR games publishers, for example, to advertise to these WebXR users because they're already wearing the headset. You know you're targeting a user in VR that has, for example, a MetaQuest 3 device. And so uh, giving them an advertising for uh, or advertisement for a VR game in the MetaQuest store can be super interesting. Mm, right. So it is the option to give something extremely targeted and in yep. because you are experiencing this on the web. Yeah. Very interesting point. So what are some example of uh, apps uh, that are built on the web that in your impression really capture what are the limits that the web on which the web can be pushed, let's say at the moment? I think some of the biggest WebXR experiences that are coincidentally also built on Wonderland Engine uh, are the Escape Artist, for example. The Escape mm -hmm. Artist is a puzzle escape room game built by Paradelsky Creative, a Missouri-based uh, creative agency. And they also won the WebXR uh, awards a couple times and they have a Webby Award, like a People's Choice Webby Award for this experience. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. You can not distinguish it from a native app from a graphical perspective and also from a Polish UX and uh, narrative experience perspective. Um, there's some other really cool multiplayer experiences like uh, the fitness resort is building Hoverfit, which is basically a, a racing game where you're on a hover um, hoverboard and you're doing squats to <laughs> propel yourself forward. And it's super fun, That's especially one I tried. with friends. Uh, it's nice. And they have like um, new types of monetization, innovative ways of monetization coming up very soon. Um, and then Vite Rabbit XR is currently working on a multiplayer archery game. So you might, if you've played games in the MetaQuest browser before, you'll know the archery games. That's archery training, archery, uh, archery evolution now is, is the new one, but there's also archery dungeon and they'll have a multiplayer experience coming up very, very soon. You brought up a few times this multiplayer, like how, how difficult or simple, or maybe what are the challenges around building multiplayer apps on the web since you just mentioned it? Multiplayer apps in general is uh, surprisingly easy because the web is obviously built for internet and communication through the internet. You have multiple ways of doing that. You can do like a peer-to-peer -peer model where you connect people directly mm -hmm. to each other, or you can have a server in between, and that can then be connected to via either web sockets or WebRTC. And WebRTC is usually used for video and audio, but also can be used for data, which makes it an ideal target also for like real-time action multiplayer uh, environments. We actually have a multiplayer solution coming up with Wonderland Cloud. And the very interesting thing about it is that we mix all audio of all the players in the cloud with precisional HRTF based um, like audio, which means you can hear people from the right, left, top, back, front, all of that, like full spatialized audio. But it doesn't take the performance of the device, but does it in the server and it preserves bandwidth by only sending one audio stream down and one audio stream up. So this is uh, this is a thing that we offer now and we just started running some courses on it um, so that people can learn how to build like multi-user events, but also multi-user games and all these kind of things. It's a very, very flexible service. So if people would want to join this course, how does that work? Uh, so you'll find a lot of it on LinkedIn. You can subscribe okay. to the Wonderland Engine newsletter and be informed once our next uh, kind of spots open. Otherwise, it's wonderlandengine.com slash courses. That's it. So perfect. I'm going to find uh, people will find it then for sure in the, in the description. I, I want to talk more about the Wonderland Engine because you mentioned now how you facilitate that part of uh, multiplayer, like in the communication mm -hmm. side. Before going into that, I have one more question regarding just the type of content. Right. So we are discussing a lot about games, 
But mm-hmm. are there other opportunities beyond games, beyond entertainment? And I'm talking about both the B2B spaces, but also, to be honest, something that is also like just a creative app or a collaborative mm-hmm. app or a productivity app. Because I struggled to find example of this. I want to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. There, there is a lot of examples already, like some enterprise applications that are basically, if you know enterprise VR, you can do the same thing also on the web. Like there's no you know, reason why it wouldn't be able to run on the web. You're even um, kind of like detaching yourself from, from the underlying hardware. So you can easily switch from the MetaQuest to a Pico device to anything recent. And the nice thing is you don't even, that's actually an advantage I haven't mentioned about the web yet. It's future proof. Every future headset will already support your application versus often you would have to upgrade to the next SDKs and these kind of things when you're running on native. Um, for creative apps, though, there's things like painting applications or like for spraying, like, you know, King Spray, um, which is like maybe a little more while back, but it's a really nice uh, VR experience where you can kind of like do graffiti spray. And uh, there's also a graffiti spraying app for WebXR called Spray Space. Um, I do could imagine something like Shapes XR uh, exporting to the web and then being able to kind of give prototypes. Uh, two people that might not even be in VR and kind of click through them or something like that. That doesn't exist yet, but maybe in the future. And um, we have product configurators, for example. Those are less XRE because they're usually used from a computer or from a mobile device. Um, but they're, especially Wonderland Engine, is super interesting because we unlock performance on iOS mobile Safari devices. Um, and that is usually where a lot of the users uh, come from that are looking for purchasing high-end products that provide these kind of product configurators. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I still, when I think about productivity app, you know, I, I, the way why I see them, uh, let's say, having, let's say, being good to be on the web is because they are more functional and they are less about the beauty and the... And, you know, one of the problems of challenges is always having, for example, beautifully rendered environments and maybe having uh, lights, and shadows, and a lot of us. But when you're building okay. a productivity app, you rely less on that. That is less important in a way. And there is a more functional element. So I would have... I would have hoped and I would expect that people mm-hmm. uh, also invest more. Like there are a wide varieties, like, for example, brainstorming app. And uh, there are indeed meeting apps. There are these uh, pro- uh, apps where you have screens. So there are others that allows you to maybe review models and so on. So a, a mm-hmm. wide variety. Um, I would hope to see more on the web, but maybe I just need to search better. And we will discuss where to search later because that is another very point very important yep. point where do we find all this app i want to uh, go into another topic that is okay web is important great there are a lot of advantages now how do we build what kind of framework are available and how does wonderland engine stacks against the other uh, the other options <laughs> all right so the landscape of development tools or frameworks basically can be categorized in three pieces. You have ed, um, like code-only frameworks like 3.js or Babylon.js. Also, A-Frame probably falls into this category where you write code to build up your scene, uh, write code to load assets, and then display those assets. Um, then there's cloud-based editors. That means you're going to a website. You have a 3D editor there. You usually combine that with a little bit of code, but there's also a lot of no-code solutions that are just drag and drop and kind of... Um, easy accessible, but probably limited in, in some way in terms of what kind of interactivity you can do. And then there's full development solutions that you download, install, kind of like Unity. And Wonderland Engine also falls into this category where you have a 3D editor that does hopefully the optimizations for you and then exports a web package that you can upload to a static web server. Um, in this case, Wonderland Engine is one of those. You can download it for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. And then you have a native 3D editor on your computer that is able to kind of compress all of your assets, um, produce a very nice uh, binary package that can st- be streamed over the web, and then a uh, bundle set with some WebAssembly and JavaScript and an index.html file that you can then upload to 
Amazon AWS, uh, uh, Google Cloud, uh, DigitalOcean, any, anything that can host static websites. That might even be GitLab pages or GitHub pages, which is usually free. Uh, we also have Wonderland pages, which is an offering of the Wonderland Cloud to deploy pages easily for like, especially like allowing WebAssembly threads to be enabled and these kind of things, which usually like a little bit harder to enable when you're deploying. Um, yeah, that's, I think the, the gist. And so, so let's imagine now there are all these options. Mm -hmm. And so what, what advice would you give to people when choosing what's the right platform for them? So if you don't know how to code or don't want to learn how to code, then probably find a uh, easy no code solution. There's a bunch of those out there. I think uh, eighth wall and Zapar both offer very nice solutions for something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're looking to build something very simple, like just like a product configurator, maybe that is literally just like has like two or three options. There's really cool viewers by Sketchfab, for example, that you can just plug and play, upload your model, and then you can like have that model be displayed. If you want like high interactivity and like a complex scene, complex environment, maybe it's more like a game or a training solution or something like that, then obviously I recommend Wonderland Engine because it allows you to manage complex projects and it'll handle all the optimization for you. So if you are rendering like tens of thousands of objects, we can render that as efficiently through the browser as if it were a native application. So there's no more difference in terms of performance, whether you're running through the browser or running mm -hmm. on, a, on a native app, but you get all the advantages of the web with WebXR. So, um, yeah. And so let's imagine I decided, okay, great. I think Wonderland Engine is the best choice with me, um, but I have a game that is the least, let's say, at least optimized for a Quest device, right? Mm -hmm. So. There is a certain level of optimization, of course, because it's still a standalone a mobile device. Um, yep. But then, what are the steps that you suggest me? That you suggest developers, a studio or a team, to take in order to port this experience to the web using the Wonderland engine? So, if you already have a game, you have multiple ways of doing that. If the game is built in Unity, there is a open source exporter by Deep Panther that allows you to export a Unity game into with the HTML5 target of Unity uh, so that it is WebXR compatible. Um, unfortunately, with that, it, it's just not really optimized for WebXR. So you'll have to s potentially scale down the solution and you won't be able to enable anti-aliasing uh, just because of the kind of like performance requirements on the web. Um, anti-aliasing is really important because it basically makes everything look more crisp, more high resolution. Um, otherwise, you get a lot of crawly lines, especially with like the small mm. movements that the head is doing all the time. Jaggy. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, on, on Wonderland Engine, for that reason, we don't even allow disabling anti-aliasing. It's just always enabled. Um, but uh, if you want to have a very performant solution, you would export all your assets, uh, import them into Wonderland Engine. You would rewrite the C Sharp code, for example, in this case, might be a different uh, engine than Unity, then it's a different language. You'll have to rewrite it in either TypeScript or JavaScript. And then thanks to like the efficient uh, iteration times of Wonderland Engine, being able to kind of save and immediately it packages a production version of the project and then reloads the browser to show you all the changes. Um, should be pretty straightforward, but you will have to go through that kind of manual effort of rewriting the code in TypeScript or JavaScript. And when we talk about, for example, assets uh, instead, so let's imagine, for <laughs> example, textures or meshes, <laughs> uh, is that something that the Wonderland engine manages on itself? And actually maybe yes. I have to say also lighting, for example, right? That is another, also another important aspect. How does that the uh, engine manages that and help teams? So Wonderland engine manages all your assets, also manages deep, like standard compression of those assets. Textures are gonna get basis universal, compression applied, meshes are going to be optimized with Mesh Optimizer, um, animations uh, running through our own kind of compression algorithms, um, and so on and so forth. So to preserve really fast download times on the web and being able to stream those assets, mm -hmm. Wonderland Editor is going to do a lot on, you, on your assets there to make that possible. Um, you don't have to downscale your assets, uh, especially for textures. We're able to handle super high resolution textures due to our texture streaming solution. 
the texture streaming will basically look at what is your currently your frame currently rendering and then check okay which textures do i need on the gpu and which do i not need on the gpu and i'll swap pieces of textures in and out at different resolutions to be able to use the um, mobile processors like gpu memory as efficiently as possible and be able to like really have like even 16 to 32k textures on there um, and basically just render them based on your distance to them in the resolution that is needed and uh, I wanted to have a quick break to remind you that if you like this conversation, you should check all past episodes at xraispotlight.com. Also, if you don't want to miss anything, remember to subscribe to the XR AI Spotlight newsletter and you will immediately get an, an updated list with over 200 mixed reality apps you can filter from various fields, weekly in-depth interviews, and one product spotlight personally tested by me right in your mailbox every week. And now let's get back to the show. So for lighting, um, we provide full real-time lighting. We have uh, point lights, spotlights, uh, directional lights. Uh, we even have environmental probes for physically based shading. So you should have all the tools necessary to achieve the same effect. You can write custom shaders and GLSL to build really whatever you like. And we even have real-time shadows. So we can render like for multiple lights we can render real-time shadows move the light around see the shadows update in real time and even if there's skinned characters in the way of the light the shadow is going to update in real time cool stuff so now i have built my app right and uh, how do people discover it so that's from <laughs> the studio side and how me as a user that is curious, I want to explore something, find cool apps. So how does uh, offer meet demand on this web space? <laughs> so there's the primary way of visibility for WebXR currently is the gateways of the browsers. All the browsers have a new tab page where it's basically when you open it the first time or if you have no tabs open, it will show a list of recommended experiences. <laughs> And these lists of recommended experiences are very well maintained by all the browser developers. For example, MetaQuest browser or Volvic um, all have one of those lists. And you can easily reach out to them and get your experience featured um, if it meets like a certain kind of requirements that they have. Um, if your experience is not uh, going to match those requirements, then you have further options. For games, there's Hey VR, for example. Hey, VR is a platform with like 50 or more free... Sorry, Jonathan, can I, can I interrupt one second? Yeah. Because this is something that I haven't thought about. So this means technically, and that is true, just to iterate it, that every time I launch, I put on the headset and I launch the browser, there is, is a it? chance that I might see someone's app. Because uh, that is... You will see of... many apps, yes. And that's, Correct. that's and... also like there's a huge amount of traffic going through that because every MetaQuest user at some point in their lifetime will click on that browser if they're bored or if they see, oh, a browser, I want to go to YouTube or something and look at YouTube and VR, that's cool. Um, but they'll see like a huge amount of um, experiences that are recommended and curated by the um, browser developers and browser teams so, and those headset manufacturers. So this is very yeah. important, I think. Uh, and before, I, I want to also move forward in if that's not an opportunity, but what are the yeah. parameters that these a browser curators, right, better being Meta or being Wolvic, uh, look for in apps to be featured in that first page, let's say. It's usually the requirements that you'll see in every VR store. Things like don't like move the camera of the head of the user around like without him actually moving. So don't make the user sick, basically. Like just like right. really standard stuff. Things like um, make sure that you can get into the game fairly fast so that you, it's like it's fun for the user quickly right yeah. um as in like don't like move them through like 10 logins and whatnot um no, but i believe they that also they test it so they, they kind of like, yeah they do try the experience so, yeah. of course they 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 actively curate them so you you do have to kind of like show yes this is a kind of fun game that's something that is worth featuring it will put the browser into a good light and it will put oh, yeah, kind of like 
WebXR into a good light. I think that's the main re like main things that are important to them. They wouldn't want a user to kind of go into an experience, feel like, oh no, this is terrible. I'll never want to play a browser game again or a browser experience again, right? Um, so as long as you you're on the right track there, I think usually it's reasonable. Um, yeah, and apologies for interrupting. I just wanted to make a point because this is another when we were talking about being accessible and and being in front of people's on any device, right? So this is <laughs> I just wanted to stress that. But you say so if that is not an opportunity, what are the other options for uh, teams? So there's uh, websites that collect experiences from various WebXR directories to something like HeyVR, which is a games platform, browser games platform only for VR. They have like over 50 experiences now, free games that you can play in the browser. And they're getting like better and better with with every year. I go try some some of them out. It's HeyVR, H-E-Y-V-R <laughs> dot I-O. And um, you can just upload your game uh, submit it there and even if it's not featured on the meta quest browser for example or volvic you'll get quite a bit of traffic from other players uh, or from other games that are featured there and therefore bring like a lot of traffic onto the platform and kind of like sending it your way one question uh regarding mixed reality so yeah. i mm -hmm. have recently built a list with 300 plus mixed reality apps on Quest, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, and it's all the apps that I could ever find, literally. The good, the bad, I went on side quest, I can filter for mixed reality, I can go on the store and filter. Anybody that's subscribed to my newsletter actually get access to it. But I was having a really hard time finding web XR app that have a mixed reality component. Mm -hmm. There is no tag, there is no filter, seems like. And I know about a couple that are very good that I could recommend anybody to try. One, for example, being Spatial Fusion, that is incredible mm -hmm. because it, it really makes it room scale 100% uh, mm -hmm. and really believable. The other one is Meet Wall. Uh, there is this AI agent uh, owl uh, that actually talks to you, explains you about the forest. Very <laughs> beautiful. But what are the other places where I can look for more WebXR apps that have a mixed reality component and put it on the list. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, MetaQuest uh, kind of like new tab page that recommends a lot of experiences is a good good place to find them. Like you mentioned, there's no tags for them at the moment. You can't filter by mixed reality as far as I know. Um, also on HeyVR, there's no tag, but there's things like Wonderbricks, for example, is a really nice uh, mixed reality experience, which is kind of a little bit like Minecraft, you can build like your uh, base castles and environments with that. Uh, also in mixed reality, um, there's also a chess game in mixed reality that you can play on there. Uh, construct chess, and um, okay, I think, I'm gonna check think those like two. I'm gonna yeah. There's also the uh, graffiti spraying um, one. That one is pretty cool. Spraspace.art, and that allows you to also spray in virtual reality and. It even uses the room setup, if I remember correctly. So you can spray your own wall <laughs> if you like. That's, nice. that's, that's pretty cool. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check it out. So Wonder Bricks, uh, the chess games, and Wonder Spray, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, right? Spraspace.art. Spraspace. I'm going to check it out. Since we are talking briefly about mixed reality, uh, I do have a question because are there ways... So what's the easiest way right now, if there is any to build a mixed reality app on the web that, for example, take mm -hmm. advantage of the Quest feature, like, for example, room scanning, depth, and so on. How does that work? So the WebXR has a WebXR device API, the API that allows you to interface with the VR devices through browser pages. And that exposes a bunch of features to do a mixed reality. Uh, it's called the Im uh, immersive <laughs> AR mode. And that allows you to just pass through the video feed and then draw anything on top that you like. It also gives you access to uh, semantic uh, planes, they call it, which is basically the room setup of the MetaQuest, for example, where you'll have planes in, in virtual space and they'll be tagged with something like plant, desk, these kind of things. So you know already, okay, this is a plant, this is a screen. I maybe want to 
have something come out of a screen. This is a wall. I want to like put a crack in the wall or something like that. Um, and since you're able to render anything you want and using the depth um, depth sensor data, so you you have a way to kind of get the depth buffer for occlusion even, and that should allow you even to like wave your hand in front of and behind virtual objects and all these kind of things. Hand tracking is also available. So like all of these features are already exposed through web WebXR, the WebXR device API. You should be fully able to do all of what you, what you want there. Perfect. Good to know because I always had the impression that in that case, uh, the web it's, it's get more complicated by just saying, no, that's not the case, right? So there is all those information that our, our developers can access to build their own experiences. I, I want to kind of like, do or now a transition a bit because I would like also to get a little bit of an understanding from you how is this web evolved let's say over over the last years and how you see that moving forward for example I mean have you seen anything changing when Apple joined the race let's say so about the kind of WebXR or web-based VR and AR space changing there's Back in 2017, I think was like, or even 2016 was the first version of web VR, right? We had that VR, it didn't really think about or consider AR yet. And all these kind of things eventually evolved into like a completely like from scratch standard web XR that built on what they've learned on web XR, uh, web VR, sorry. Um, and since then things have become really, really stable. So now it, it it's kind of like you can rely on WebXR in a way. It's also in by, for example, browser teams like the MetaQuest browser team. It's really being pushed forward to be almost at the edge of what's possible uh, on all of these devices. Like we just mentioned, mentioned all the mixed reality features. All of those are available because the browser developers are pushing for those features in the standard and making sure that we have those even on the web very quickly. Um, with Apple. Uh, it is amazing to see how um, how supportive they are of the WebXR standard, and how even is with it? like the first, it, yeah, even with it? the first versions of the headset, they had mm -hmm. WebXR in the browser, and now it is mm -hmm. enabled by default. So you have full support of WebXR, not the mixed reality parts, because they do not want to give access to the camera feed in uh in in the browser just for safety reasons i think they're kind of still working out how that might be possible in some way but you can do fully immersive experiences and things like the ex escape artist for example can be played on apple vision pro today so if you put in esc.art then you'll um, be able to play the escape artist from start to finish on the apple vision pro i'm gonna try as well and and the reason why i ask is it it's because I have mm -hmm. heard of some developers that is like, yeah, it is very tricky to uh, build for uh, when you're building for the Vision Pro on web. Uh, it, it doesn't seem as streamlined as some people claim it to be. Or am I just maybe misunderstanding? I mean, it it is fully compatible. It is uh, following the standards. There's one slight difference where the input events for like pointing and clicking on something uh, because they use the eye tracking and they don't want to expose the uh, user's eye tracking kind of like characteristics and information which may be potentially identifiable. And on the web, you're always trying to keep the user as private as possible, right? Um, so they have a, a special um, special standard that they use for, the, uh, for, for giving that in a very pri privacy sensitive way. Um, but aside from that, uh, it works great. They have great support of WebGL 2 there, so you can do anything you like. The immersive experiences, like I said, work really well. Mm -hmm. There's just the one big difference that there's no controllers there. So if your app was built around controllers, that's difficult. But in general, even if the developer workflow with the Apple Apple Vision Pro were cumbersome, like I personally don't don't use it for development at the moment, so I can't attest to how it actually feels. You can just build it on the MetaQuest 3 and then it'll just work on the um, on the Apple Vision Pro minus that, well, you'll have to support Control. some form of hand tracking input, right? So we discuss, uh, let's say, headsets. 
right? But mm-hmm. I think everybody knows that things are going to move and are moving towards a wearable world, right? Where now there are more and more headsets, more and more glasses, literally. Like, for example, the spectacles, uh, everybody is talking about Orion, of course. Right. And I think, what are your thoughts on how the web is going to support these new devices? And I always uh, dreamt of like kind of this <laughs> AR mini apps kind of thing where you have PWAs on phones right now, right? So some of the biggest uh, apps like Twitter, for example, you can just install them from the website and they'll appear on an icon on your home screen as if they were just a normal app. And if you click on them, the URL bar disappeared and everything, it just looks like a normal app. I think something like that seems to be what the um, future of web AR might look like with these glasses contexts. You might walk into a restaurant, you'll have a QR code there, which will prompt you, do you want to use this app? You'll click that. It's going to be a PWA because you don't want to like download and install a app from, from the app store that's there forever. But it's going to be some form of web app that's just going to appear and then all of a sudden your menu turns turns into 3D and kind of shows you a preview of what your meals are going to look like. I don't know. Um, so I think that just because of this kind of micro apps being streamable over the web and being cross-platform, you don't know if someone's going to work in with Orion or with the spectacles, right? You want to support both, ideally. I think the web just offers a huge amount of advantages for that. And so, and yeah. I think you're right. And I think, I mean, I do feel the same that there are going to be these micro, it's not going to be a full game. And I don't think people want to play games on their future AR headset, right? It has to be something that connects you to the real world in a meaningful way. It's going to be practical and probably very quick, right? On which also you can interact very, very easily, right? Because that is also another important thing. When you're playing games, you are having like complex way of interacting with that game potentially, right? And we are seeing, for example, with Orion, with the neural interface, it's just going to be about slight movement of your fingers and wrist. Now, yes. what are the limitations of those? Or what, and maybe also for people that don't know, can you explain those? You mentioned PWA apps. And also, okay. what are the limitations in that case? Because I suppose that cannot do the same thing to the same extent, maybe you have other apps that you download, for example. Um, so it is harder to think of limitations nowadays because the web standards are have evolved so rapidly that there's becoming less and less differences like you can have notifications on pwas on web apps for example that might not yet what like when i'm talking about pwas there's always like two types of pwas we have those running on xr in like a headset context and then those on a mobile or desktop environment um those on mobile and desktop obviously already have more features than those uh, that we'll have on on XR, but even like just on at Meta Connect, um, they announced support for PWAs in the store. So you can now upload a 2D or even like immersive PWAs into the MetaQuest store and publish your web app, your WebXR based app in the MetaQuest store. And Pico has done something similar just previously. For example, HeyVR, the VR browser games platform, can be accessed through the Pico store and can be installed and started from there. Um, on phone uh, or mobile, you have things like you can access payments through like uh, Android Pay, uh, Google Pay, these kind of things. Um, you have the notifications, as mentioned. You couldn't even like access Bluetooth and USB. So like, there's more and more. It's basically, I think Google is pushing very, very hard to make web the platform of the future, or the computing platform of the future. And thereby, it's like the differences between both are kind of becoming less and less. And we have WebAssembly taking care of most of the CPU performance parts. And then if you use WebGL correctly, which is very, very hard to do, you can get excellent performance with that too. But WebGPU is going to make that a little bit more accessible in the future. Um, so even GPU performance is going to become easy, even though it's in, in our opinion, it's already like here now. But yeah. So I will have one more question, and that is, it seems like we have kind of like achieved a level of performance parity almost, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of feature set that with headsets in, in, in case. Uh, so what do you think is the next breakthrough or challenge that, that is required to make WebXR spread faster, more, more effective, or what is your take on the future? What, what else do we need? 
I honestly, I think WebXR is here. It's ready. It's here to stay. In my opinion, uh, it's I think more of a mindset thing where um, if you've learned Unity for ten years or even longer, then you're not going to easily make the switch to a new platform. And because Unity doesn't work well on WebXR, um, you're basically locked out of WebXR by well, I don't want to want to like invest all that time again. Even though like a lot of your knowledge will translate over and uh, most uh, frameworks out there have ways to learn as a Unity or Unreal Engine developer. Um, but it, it, it's obviously, it's different. Like you'll be building for a streaming based context. You'll want to download and install and not, not install, but download the first kind of seconds of the game as quickly as possible. And the rest can wait, right? Uh -huh. Because you want the user to hop immediately into the experience. You don't have a store that downloads like multiple gigabytes for you and then you start the experience, but mm -hmm. it's going to be like yeah, that That 10 seconds of wait time makes a big difference compared to five seconds of wait time um, for user retention. And it's it's a different mindset, but I mean, even with like PWAs, like 2D PWAs, we've seen like more and more companies adopting them, more and more companies building them. And I think they're they're generally because of their advantages they have a higher likelihood of success mm -hmm. and thereby it's just a matter of time until like that advantage of success likelihood is gonna out like just outgrow that of the native space and that is limited always to one platform or you have extra effort to making it portable to other platforms as well and um deployment is more difficult and 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 then right so i think it's a matter of time Jonathan, thank you very much. I have a long list of stuff that I need to try right now. Uh, and I'm sure that many people that I've heard that have a similar need. So that's great because I think that's all what this conversation are about. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. Uh, thank you, Gabriele. It was very, very great. Thank you for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to talk about Wonderland Engine. Thank you very much for listening in. If you like the show, please leave a rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or a thumbs up on YouTube. It really means a lot to me, and it's a great support for the show. Till next time.